Okay, we're doing this. Ah, cute puppy. Aw, pumpkin puppy. Oh, by the way, before I... So there's this um, recovery journal. Somebody sent it to me. Look at this. Amygdala hijacking. The word is getting out. The word is getting out. The recovery community. Fight, flight, or freeze. I always forget about that. It's fight, flight, or freeze. Amygdala does that too. Within six seconds for a total hijack of your functioning. That's how fast amygdala. I mean, amygdala is like one three hundredths of a second, and you know changes in facials, but in terms of just going from ha ha to ha six seconds. It can take up to four hours to recenter. And of course the guy says the first thing we need to do is, what did I just, breathe. It's a six deep breaths. Belly breaths, not bikini breaths. What does he say? Yeah, immediately take six deep breaths. Uh, writing things down. Anyway, I looked and went, ha, huh, okay. Word is out. Adolescence. You're going to enjoy this. A mother passing by her son's bedroom was astonished to see that his bed was nicely made. Everything was picked up. She knew something must be wrong. Then she saw an envelope propped up prominently on the pillow that was addressed to, quote, mom, unquote. Oh, with the worst premonition, she opened the envelope with trembling hands and read the letter. Dear Mom, it is with great regret and sorrow that I'm writing to you. I had to elope with my new girlfriend because I wanted to avoid a scene with Dad and you. I've been finding real passion with Stacy, and she's so nice. But I knew you would not approve of her because of all of her piercing tattoos, tight motorcycle clothes, and the fact that she is much older than I am. But it's not only the passion. Mom, she's pregnant. Stacy said that we'll be very happy. She owns a trailer in the woods and has a stack of firewood for the whole winter. We, are, we share a dream of having many more children. <coughs> Stacy has opened my eyes to the fact that marijuana doesn't really hurt anyone. We'll be growing it for ourselves and trading it with the other people that live nearby for cocaine and ecstasy. We're planning eventually to move to Colorado. I added that part because this was a little older thing, but I thought I'd update a little bit. In the meantime, We'll pray that science will find a cure for AIDS so Stacy can get better. <laughs> I love your expression. <laughs> she deserves it. But don't worry, Mom. I'm 15, and I know how to take care of myself. Someday I'm sure that we will be back to visit so that you can get to know all of your grandchildren. Love, your son, John. P.S. Mom, none of the above is true. I'm over at Tommy's house. I just want to remind you that there are worse things in life than the report card that's in my center desk drawer. <laughs> I love you. Call me when it's safe to come home. <laughs> huh? Huh? Love that. I don't even remember where I saw that, but it was like, <sighs> how perfect is that? So what was on the wall of your room when you were 15 years old? Um. Posters of famous people. Such as? Britney Spears, Orlando Bloom. <laughs> She's turning red in case, you, in case you're missing it. The camera can't see, but maybe we can reflect. Oh, you're turning redder. I'm sorry, we'll pull it back. <laughs> what was important to you? So your 15-year-old you is here now. We're saying, hey, what matters? What's important to you? I'd say my group of friends, just playing with them. We usually would play basketball or you know, go to the movies. It was like probably the time where we started to hang out around the movie theater and socializing okay. and stuff like that. Where, where was this, by the way? Where Del Mar. Oh, okay, way away. Yeah, I heard Del Mar. Del Mar. Okay, cool. 
so what were you, she's looking at me like a main yeah. guest here. Yeah, so what were you, yeah, I know, I'm kind of going, you should go back, but I, you know, I'll just stay here. You were pretty um, to be. What were you wearing? What were you wearing? Um, pretty similar to this. Okay, <laughs> cash. Yeah. Okay. What was important to you? Um, kind of like the said, hanging out with my friends. Um, I had one friend in particular, we're both only children, a couple months apart, so we spent a lot of time together. Yeah. What was somebody? What was the worst thing you did and you got caught? I'll just throw that out for somebody. Yeah, you're okay. Go. <laughs> sure, it was good enough. Uh, gotcha. You're on. You're on. Um, probably drinking. Drinking. What should we ask? What were you drinking? Well, I just remember this. Oh, oh she's already she's already starting to get a little defensive. I didn't really get in trouble, but okay. with my boyfriend, and we opened a bottle of wine in my house, and he's okay. like, "You gotta let it breathe." Like we're like, <laughs> <laughs> this guy had class. Gotta let the fine cabernet, I might say. And my mom comes down and she's like, "I knew what you guys were doing when I heard you gotta let it breathe." <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic. Really, I would have thought she would have thought something else, but that's very cool. So, what was the consequence? You didn't really get trouble. You didn't really get. She joined you. Said, "Hey, wait, no, wait, wait. No, Got to swirl first. I don't remember. Okay. Anything. Okay. So, somebody, what was the worst thing you did, and you didn't get caught? Remember, the first day I told you, you never have to answer any question that I ask you. This might be a good time to pull that card. <laughs> What was the worst thing you did you did not get caught? You're 15, 16, we can push it up a little because then you have driving lessons. I don't know. Oh, have you got caught? Anything? Somebody. Paul, I don't know, since uh, you're like that. <coughs> stealing street signs. Oh, wow. He still has them on his wall. Not stop signs, though. That's, that's no, <laughs> yield. <laughs> Over the bed. Sorry. It's like uh, names of roads of friends of ours. Yeah. You would steal. Yes. Wow. And you'd come back in the night. What? You'd come back that night. You, I assume you stole these at night. Uh, yeah. And uh, <laughs> police car started following us. And it was, he never turned on his lights. So, but it, it was a whole minor kind of chase scene. And I won't go into all the details. <laughs> really? Did they, but you didn't get caught. No. Tires coming around the corner. Wow. No, then we ran back to this house. There was a party at, and oh, wow. he was in that house, and had the whole party turn off all the lights, and the cop pulled up and was looking at the car, like trying to figure out what apartment we were in. Oh God, your heart! Yeah, it was a good time. It was a good time. <laughs> it was a great. I miss those days. Where was this, by the way? Uh, Burlington, Vermont. God, you're not building a case, are you? Like, I was going to say, and this is being recorded, Your Honor. Yeah. Camera, camera. Yeah, you know, I don't know. If you think, I was gonna say, there's still a warrant out for you. They're still hunting you. Did I tell you the time, the first time my parents left me alone? Did I tell you this one? So I'm 16. Mom has a uh, 64 Rambler. Actually, kind of cool car. And my dad, it, 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 my dad had some kind of a workshop in Monterey. So they are leaving Wednesday morning and returning. Thursday. It's just an overnight thing. I'll never forget it. And mom hands me the keys and says, take the car to school. You can take it surfing and, you know, just stay around town. And we'll see you tomorrow. I said, wow, cool. Huge northwest swell. <coughs> Huge northwest swell. I thought, wow, this is my chance. I can go to Rincon. See, Rincon and I have a long history. I can go to Rincon and I can miss school because it'll be totally uncrowded. And I probably won't get back in time, but it's worth it. Your mom and dad, this is your former son. Yep, me and on. I'm not here because I'm at Rincon. Yep, that's in Santa Barbara. I'll take any consequence you give me. It'll be worth it. Love your former son. Drive up there. Spend the night on the train tracks. I get up, dawn. Rincon is firing, and there's count them. One other, one other guy out. That's probably the last time there's ever been only one other guy out. I will never forget the moment. 
I'm in the lineup with this one other guy. This four wave set comes. He catches the first wave. I have three waves awaiting me. Three perfect ring comes. And I actually said, no, not that one. Not. I'll take this one. I surf till about 9 o'clock. A south wind comes, blows it out, and about 40 locust people come down and take it over. And I drive home. I don't even remember what my mom did. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. What I do remember is years later, she said to me, you know when I knew you'd be just fine in life? When you went to Rincon that time. Because you did something that was really important to you. You owned it and you're willing to take any consequence for it. And it was a wonderful thing you did. My gosh, thanks, Mom. This working with Carl Rogers really is paying off for you. <laughs> True moment. Never forget it. <sighs> Somebody else, some other moment or something. Important. Yes, please. Um, when I was, um, when I was 16, 17, my parents were going on a trip. Huh? Uh -huh. and, um, I was driving this street, it was a suburban, so I was driving this really narrow street, and my, the, the little mirror on the side ah. smashed into a tow truck that was also parked on that street, it didn't even see it. So the thing, like, completely fell to the ground, mm. and so I went to, like, show you with the dealership, I was like, I need to get this fixed, I have a 3 d to get this fixed, and they're like, the unit's like $700. Oh my God. Do I even have a credit card that point? I don't know, but... Um, he, uh, he eventually said that I can just fix the mirror as opposed to like the whole unit. And oh. I literally took it to the body shop, got it fixed, picked up the car like two hours before they got home. Oh my god! But out of guilt, I told them what happened because oh. I couldn't handle it, but they would have never found out. I felt like brilliant. I <laughs> oh my god. That's brilliant. <sighs> passions. What was, Alex, what was your passions? You were 16. Uh, Sports. Which sport? Uh, uh, like baseball, football, and soccer. Is that all? <laughs> That's great. Give us a great moment in any one of those sports. Just one moment. Um, wow. Uh, winning, uh, winning a team MVP my sophomore year. Wow. Which, which sport? Baseball. Very cool. You had a great season. Did, were you expecting that? Uh, no. no. So this was kind of an award ceremony or something? Right. And they suddenly call out your name. And you were like, can you come up? Yeah. yeah. Look at that face, man. He's feeling it. Cool. Some other passion. Somebody else. Uh, horseback riding. Horseback riding. Tell us a little something about horseback riding. Where, where is this? In Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. I went to a boarding school where we spent half of the day doing horseback riding and half of the day doing class. Wow. You'd go ride right out someplace and then you'd set up a chalkboard in the wilds. And, you know. Not quite, but wow. at least you did hunter jumpers, so it was like fancy, like fancy, not English, or not western. So wow. Around the northeast doing different shows. And, and what, so if we talked to, you're what, 15, 16 ish when you're doing this? If we talked to 16, 15 year old, you now saying, and you're doing all this and saying, what would you dream of that you could be doing when you were grown up 10 years from now? What would you say? Something else. But I didn't necessarily oh. want to go to the school. So I was there at 15 and then 16, I decided to drop out of high school. I did. You dropped out of high school? I did. 16. What did you do? A lot of stuff that wasn't so great and then um, kind of moved around. Wow. And mom and dad were? Uh, mom was a hippie, so she was kind of okay with whatever. Dad was wow. a physician, so he was not so excited about it. You were enormously independent, so. Wow. So I'm at the fire ring down at La Jolla Shores. And we came in from, when we'd come in from surfing, we'd all hang around the fire ring. And it was this foggy Saturday. And I saw in the next firing two, pardon me, chicks. Duke Nielsen was kind of the stud man of our group because he had a birthmark that looked like a heart. So he thought that qualified him. He was 
good looking guy and all that. They called me Canny. Well, Connie, hey, Canner, or Canny. Hey, Canny, let's go over there and talk to those girls. I looked at her and I said, I'm going to kiss her. Because I had never kissed a girl yet. I know, I was a little behind. When I told the story to Devon, his friends like, you were how old, Dad? Oh, God. <laughs> okay. Actually, I was, must have been 15 because I wasn't driving yet. So we walk over there, hanging. I had a plan. <laughs> oh, God, I'm getting nervous already. <laughs> so we're, I was gonna, we we're going to walk to Scripps Pier. Somewhere along that walk, I was going to say something funny. She was going to go, ha, head back, wham, I'm on her. <laughs> no, I had this all planned out. Yeah, I had to like, so I could say something funny. <laughs> now I understand the freeze part of the migdalation. I'm walking, so we finally get to the walk. The sun actually comes through the fog. I mean, this is kind of cool. I, I, I mean, blink, you know. That's how you can tell people are in cults. They don't blink. I'm like, I can't think of anything to say. I'm just like, I'm freaking out. But I'm going to kiss this girl. Sounds like a song. We get to the pier. I haven't kissed her yet. Oh, God. We turn around. We're walking back. And I'll never forget. It was right in Whoops Cove. It's the parking lot after the south of the pier. And I said something. She went, huh. wham, I'm on her. It's good enough for me. Mm. Things kind of go slow motion. She goes, What did you do that for? I don't remember anything else. <laughs> I swear to God, I don't know how I got back to where all my buddies were because I had to get back, you know, kiss her before I get. I know nothing else. I swear to God, I know. <laughs> I told you I'd write things down when I call girls and then it, it sweat. But anyway, good news is years later I was with a girlfriend. I told this, and we were right there, and she said, "That was so funny." And so I got to kiss her, and she says, oh, do it again. That was wonderful. I said, oh, you're the best therapist. Thank you. <laughs> it's so innocent. True story. True story. Do you have a boyfriend or a girlfriend or whatever? Me? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> long term. Pardon me, long term. Oh, my gosh. You had a four-year boyfriend. Oh, wait. We're talking about 16 weeks. Yeah. I had a one-year. Okay. I mean, the probability is that adolescents have a relationship for years about the same as the adult for 10 years. Right. Parents approved. Yes. Okay. What happened? What happened to the relationship? Yeah. Um, I went to Torrid Pines, and he lived down in Benitez, so he went to their school. I don't know what it is. Yeah. So, no more busing it to the midpoint. Oh, yeah. We used to go to the same middle school. So, no, we just didn't see each other as much. In no uh, texting, Facebook, and Instagram to keep you connected, or FaceTime, or Skype. Yep. Plus, we both said the whole, we're too young. Why would we? Oh, we're too why young. Why would we, like, stay together? Okay. <laughs> okay. You have a slightly whimsical look about you, Liz. <laughs> so, give us something about your adolescence. Anything. What was on the wall, what your dress was important to you, a moment, anything. A moment. Whatever. About relationships? No, about your adolescence. It could be a relationship. Anything about your adolescence. Something about adolescence. Um, my second boyfriend ended up becoming my fiance. Wow. And he moved. And uh, it didn't work out, but I came back to the States. So. Came back to the States. I'm sorry, you moved? Um, so my parents are first generation immigrants from Spain. Uh huh. And my boyfriend was first generation Taiwanese, but had a contract in Ireland. So the week I graduated high school, God, I moved so to the Ireland. United Nations. Yeah. You moved to Ireland. The week you graduated high school, you moved to Ireland yes. with your then fiance. Yes. And you're what, 18? Yes. Just turned 18, turned 18 the same week. And we dated for two years at that point, and um, parents did not approve. You think? <laughs> um, I moved, and uh -huh. it didn't work out, and I came back to the States. How long did it take to not work out? Six months. Wow. You are spunky. I love these histories. <laughs> you can go on and on, but time waits. Adolescence, what are the issues? What are the tasks? What are the challenges? What is it about? I'm sorry, say what? Yeah.
I mean, it's not exactly in order, but autonomy. Identity. Yeah, that's why I have that as number one. Anything else in particular? I mean, those are kind of a biggie. Well, actually, we can let's do it this way. We'll expand. Identity. So where are they on the, you know my old thing about we, me. Where are they in this? I said one of the ways, one of the ways you can look at development is the we, me continuum. The other is what we're connected to, what we're attached to. Where are they in the we, me? They're me and in some ways not we. In some ways, not always, all the time. And they are very much we, me with peers. Healthy adolescents. Remember, it's all about peers and passions, not parents. Hopefully positive peers, positive passions. It's not about their parents. The whole energy scheme, what they are connected to is their peers and their passions. And their passions oftentimes involve autonomy. And what's my translation of autonomy? Remember the two main drives, I believe, or whatever you want to call it in human existence. One is to be connected, the other is to be Right. When we talk confidence, when we talk autonomy, I like the term causative agent because I think it's a much broader way of looking at what it's really about. They want to be the causative agent of their universe, their lives, their existence, their fates, their destinies. I believe it's the hardest population to work with because they're competent. Not too many five-year-olds are going to climb out the window with a copy of their dad's car or mom's car and have a whole plan how to get away and leave home at 15 or 16. Not too many eight-year-olds are going to do that. These folks can do that and will do that. You know there's a whole population underneath the streets of New York City. You know about this, right? Underneath the streets of New York City is, is these, I guess they're tunnels left over from tr trains or something, subways, something down there. And there's a whole population of folks, including a significant number of teenagers, that live there. Amazing. They're very, teens are capable. They form their identity, what they're attached to, connected to. You show me a teen who doesn't have peers, and I am worried. Even if they're bad peers. If I have bad peers and no peers, that's a real problem. Okay? Remember, 30,000 year old hardware. 30,000 year old hardware, pretty much the same. Lots of software updates. Teens were the alpha age back then. Life expectancy 25, 30. They're taking care of the young ones. They're taking care of old ones. They're the primal age. If you look at it that way, look at how they're set up. What do they need to do? They need to group. They need to be incredibly competent because they're the hunters, gatherers. They're the procreators. See, remember last time latency, they're already getting all about being competent and all that, but not procreating yet. Now they're procreating. They're the main generation back then. So that's a really interesting neurobio setup, if that's really what they're set up for. And that hasn't changed all that much. So they have more oxytocin. However, it's oriented pretty much exclusively towards peers. Their center of their brain, talk about identity formation, who am I? There's that area of the brain that has to do with self-awareness, self-conscious, is going absolutely bonkers. So no wonder they're so self-conscious. You show an adult, you show an adult, an adolescent, a younger person, child, pictures of faces. Mad, sad, glad, scared, all those different faces. Okay? Adolescents are much more likely to see those faces as being either angry or scared than are adults or children. Because they're amygdalating. Their amygdala is going all the time. Fight, flight, freeze. Dopamine is down in some ways. It takes more to thrill them. For example, a little simple computer game. You either win one coin, ten coins, or the whole lot. One of those three conditions. Keep have kids' latency or younger play that game. 
They're happy to win anything. Oh, I won a coin. Oh, I won three coins. Oh, I won a ball. You have an adult play that game. And it's pretty much to that the affect matches the outcome. Oh, I got a coin. Hey, 10 coins. Whoa, I won it all. You know where I'm going with this. What does an adolescent say when they get one coin? <laughs> this sucks. 10 coins. Yeah, yeah, but. Ten. Yeah, finally. What's it going to take? As you all know, prefrontal cortex, never mind dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, social judgment, all that kind of stuff, really keeps evolving, I mean, evolved our lives, really doesn't kind of like harden and settle until about 26 ish. Their reflexes, their a lot of that stuff's better than ours. Certainly better than mine, but better than yours probably. But they don't have the judgment like we do. It's not hooked up. But at the same time, it's really interesting. Because the inner philosopher, the kind of what's it all about part, it's kind of not only just focusing, focusing on self, but focusing on the world and ideas. They get very impassioned about things. I remember calling my mom a communist. You're a communist! You ought to be married to Khrushchev! And Khrushchev was the leader, though. Um, in case you don't remember or don't know, that's okay. That's when Kennedy was around. Why? Because she had a magazine from China. China was like Albania in 1964, 65. I went to La Jolla High. Kind of conservative town, conservative place. The only reason we actually got a home in the Maryland, frankly, is Balkani sounds Italian. It's actually Jewish. It's actually born in Israel, as you know. And they didn't, my mom, with the realtor and all that, didn't, when they said, oh, Balkani Italian, she didn't say no. She didn't say yes. She just changed the topic. So my mom, having a magazine from China, reading that stuff, Oh my God. And why was I so concerned? Because of my peers. What are they going to think? Because I'm going to be excluded. Remember I told you I wore blue tennis shoes the day when they went out? That's why I still don't have shoes on whenever I get a chance. The trauma. <laughs> <laughs> so, they, so they get really impassioned about things, important things. They have the inner philosopher. They've got this hyper amygdalation, but the Kind of the rational, bigger picture part isn't totally coalesced. So I've had some teens, I have one relatively recently, where he's really in an existential panic. It's kind of, long ago there's a Woody Allen movie, I don't know which one it was actually. I think it's Stardust Memories, something. When there's a scene that he's four years old, five, and his mom has to take him to the pediatrician. Why? He's sitting there, you can imagine, it's a little mini Woody with the glass, the whole thing. He looks at the pediatrician and he goes, the universe is going to end in four billion years, so what's the point of going to kindergarten? This kid was kind of like that. Very bright. And like, it's all going to end, what's the point? And he gets in these kind of panic states and whatnot. So I explained to him all of this, right by kid. I said, you're amygdalating, dude. You got your inner philosopher and look at all that. And you got to, and it just isn't myelinated yet. Affect centers, cognitive rush, just haven't quite. But don't worry, I promise in the next year, it's, you're gonna and sure enough, within a few months, he can't, not just because of that intervention, but he, he really thought, he said, you know, I get it. Because he said, you're gonna really enjoy Kierkegaard. Not that I really read Kierkegaard, but Camus, Sartre, you're gonna love these things when you go in college. Your philosopher's gonna go like, wow, I get it. Because people write a lot about exactly what you're talking about. What's the meaning of life, what's the point, all that stuff. It's just, you, you, you've got the concept, but you've, get the split between the feeling and concept, but it'll come together. And sure enough, he came in and said, you know, I sometimes think about this stuff, but I'm no longer afraid I'm going to get sucked down the shower or the drain, or the drain when I'm taking a shower. So know that. You're going to get some adolescents that are going to be like, and tell them that you're extremely bright. It's the inner philosopher. hasn't hooked up with the feeling part. Okay? Okay. Some more about lacking judgment. So I see this lovely adolescent who I think is abusing substances. And one of the things she does, oh, that's the other thing, talk about this disconnection with affect. She comes in and says, you know, you know that overpass at UTC? It's in the roads? Yeah. 
So my boyfriend and I were like walking on that over and we kind of thought, whoa, wouldn't it be cool to like climb up the like that guard thing that says, oh, we can't jump, and just kind of stand at the top there and look down. She's got these bright eyes like. I said, wait, 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 what? Huh? Supplying the missing affect. The huh? Okay. So so I had a little carpet thing. I don't know why I used to keep this little carpet there. But anyway, so we folded it up. I guess it's a rug. I guess carpet is this. It's a rug. We fold, I said, I want you to fold this up for how wide it was where you were standing. So she does. And it was about maybe eight inches, literally. So you're st so, you remember, so we're standing and you're like how far oh I'm about thirty feet or something. Cars going by? Yeah. We're holding hands. I said, so you're you're basically a sneeze away from oblivion. Is that right? Yeah. What's my feeling? What am I feeling right now as, I'm, as you're saying this? You're scared. What am I scared about? That I'm going to get killed. And where's, where's that thought in your head? Right here. Good. Pardon me. Touch that spot when you want good judgment. <laughs> you know about Banner and Glindler's structure of magic? It's anchoring thoughts and feelings in the body. Sorry, man, you blush again. <laughs> They're like that. So what is the treatment implications of this kind of mindset, developmental set? What are the implications for treatment? Well, it's one of the things I just did in this example. It's okay for me. Well, you had her take your perspective of how other people would view her actions even though she didn't feel scared in that moment. Yeah. The number one thing you got to do, of course, like with any client, but particularly with adolescents, is, of course, connect with them. You've got to connect with them. You've got to connect with them. And in order to connect with them, you've got to connect with what it is they're connected to, because they are deeply connected to things, even if it's making a cause against you. I mean, they have cause celebrates, man. They're like, whatever it is, you've got to connect with that. I've got to know about their world. So they'll show me their songs on YouTube and stuff. If they've done something on YouTube, I want to see it. I mean, it is a different world now with the technologies. I usually kind of ask them to turn off their phones, or at least if they're doing something on it, I'll go, well, wait, show me what you took. Not because I'm being nosy, I want to share with you. I want to know what your world's about. What, what are you into? I want to know. I've got to connect. It is a fragile alliance. Remember way back when I talked about shifting? Okay, pop quiz. What is shifting? The whole state, not even just the emotion. Creating in others our own inner states. Emotion is certainly an important part of it, but the worldview, the whole thing. Adolescents are borderlines and adolescents, but equally brilliant at shifting. You are around an adolescent, as I've said before, and one of two states are going to happen fairly quickly. You're going to feel like you are the world's greatest therapist, and they should just give you your PhD, give you your license, and just let you go on with healing the world, especially adolescents, because they're going to say things like, I've never been able to talk like this with anybody. I feel so safe around you. The best therapist. The best I've had a lot of them. You're the 15th, and you're the best one. And then what happens the next time they don't show up for the session? Or they diss you. Oh, God, are they brilliant at dissing you? Oh, my God. Whatever it is you're insecure about, whatever it is, maybe you have some little one gray hair. That was a long time ago. They'll out. Oh, send the gray there, little, are you? Huh? Oh, yeah? <laughs> no, I think it's just, it's probably just a little surf wax got in the hair. It's unbelievable what they will, how they find it. It's unbelievable. They'll shift their insecurities. So you have to make a connection. And then once you do have a connection, then you get to say things like, wait a minute. Huh? What? What are you seeing in this face? Fear and disbelief and wrinkles. <laughs> oh, yeah. Then you can move with them. They're autonomous, but they're also still dependent in ways. They move into every once in a while, well, it's a we, not me. They'll move into suddenly a we, me with a parent. Oh, please, a comment. I had a question. Um, <coughs> consultation for yourself there or ways to connect with people that specifically work with adolescents. 
Oh God, that's a great question. I have no idea. San Diego Psych Association would know. There's a child and adolescent consultation group that meets once a month, and they are gals. Is it SDPA? Mm -hmm. Okay. I would imagine it is a very it is a very hard population, very hard population to work with. And again, part of it is the fragile alliance. You, and then they'll just this you hate you. They won't come back. They don't want to come anymore. This is boring. This is stupid. And they will they will amygdalate you. They will. Remember what happens when your amygdala gets fired? What's the first thing that happens when your amygdala fires? Boom! What's the first thing that happens? Yeah, but right, you get scared, mad, scared, or something. Your empathy system immediately shuts down. I had two reunification therapies yesterday, and I looked and said, "You're amygdalating." Is the empathy immediately shut down? Your perspective narrows. You're going to do the fight, flight, freeze, like that idea. You're going to get defensive. Well, wait a minute, blah, 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 or offensive. Blah, blah, blah. You're not going to be functioning well at all. So you got to, and they will get you. It's amazing. So this 14-year-old comes to my office. Why is she brought in? Because it was a Sunday afternoon in her parents' bedroom, and I don't know how to put this politely. She was boinking a 25-year-old. She's 14 years old. What? Her dad walks in. It's like a movie. The guy literally is pulling his pants off, running out the window and down the road, the fields. This spunkatizer also <laughs> comes in my office and gleefully says, now you can't say anything to my parents, right? This is totally confidential. I can see you from your $1 million liability policy, leave you your Porsche, your surfboards, and your guitar, but take everything else. Is that right? Uh, it depends. You remember the child abuse, abuse, elderly, plan to murder somebody, danger self other. Is she going to lose domestic violence? Yeah. But that's okay. This isn't many of those. So, so last night, I woke up at 2 in the morning. She lives in Poway. Okay, can you remember this? She lives in Poway. Remember where Poway is? And I snuck to the OB pier and hung up with these really cool guys. Well, Connie, don't look like that. I was with my friend, and she's 16. Oh, okay, so 16 and 14, two girls, never been raped, pillaged, plundered, murdered, nothing, none of that's ever happened. Oh, God, relax. You know what? And I love this. It's like a bumper sticker for adolescence. You know, I realized I wouldn't mind living off my parents. I just didn't have to live with them. Oh, that's perfect. I'm going to quote you forevermore. That is a bumper sticker for adolescence. I wouldn't mind living off my parents. I need you. But I just didn't have to live with you. <laughs> this reminds me of Ron about age 13. As we, I used to have this little cute house on Sea Lane. I'm driving into Bishops. And he goes, Dad, I wish you kept the house on Sea Lane. I go, yeah, that would be kind of cool. Then. Why? So I could live there. When? Now. You want to go live there? Yeah. Who take care of you? Mika. Mika's well, our nanny. She'd come, she'd cook, she'd clean, she'd do all that stuff. He said, it'd be really close. I could just skateboard to Bishop. She wouldn't have to drive me. I said, when do I see you? Oh, I'd come over and we'd surf together and stuff. Love your independence. <laughs> that was the problem. Exactly. They bought my parents and we had to live with them. Can you believe he's graduating tomorrow? Oh my God. Oh my God. Thank you, thank you, thank you. But just, it's amazing. Back to the one who's over the freeway. Or not freeway, but that roadway thing. I also said, you know, I think you have a substance problem. She goes, no, I don't. So I say, under what conditions would you think you do have one? And what, you know, tell me what your criteria point is. She says, when my friends, hello, when my friends say I have a problem. So one of the implications of working with adolescents is bring in their friends. I said, great, bring in your friends. Ha, ah, subclause. We've got to make sure it's okay with their parents. I'm not their therapist. They're my collateral contacts. And obviously with your parents who are paying for this endeavor. Okay with everybody. Friends came in, three of them. Made it clear, I'm not your therapist. You're my consultant in helping her take loving, responsible, respectful care of herself. How do you think she's doing? Be honest. They can be honest, right? And she's going to say, yeah, I want you to be honest. We love her. She's fantastic. We worry about her. Oh, really? 
What do you worry about? And what did they say? Substance. She drinks too much. And she drinks and she drives. And she also drinks and does dope. And we worry about you. Because it can help us play by. <laughs> <laughs> She um, went to a program. She said, okay, fine, you win. I'll go to a program. She did go to a program. And she did better, you know, the rehab thing for 30 days. But she struggled. I mean, this is not easy. It's not easy growing up. She is fine and fabulous in the world now as an adult with a child and all that other stuff. I did run into her years later. I'm putting an envelope in her mailbox. I look up this woman, and she says, Dr. V. And I'm like, it's me. We'll call her Cindy. Cindy. I went, oh my god, Cindy. You're like a grown-up version of you. Oh my god. She goes, you know, I never got a chance to tell you. True story. I was pretty messed up, and I was pretty confused. And I got to tell you, it was really great to have somebody that I could talk to. And no matter what I said, you would listen. And I didn't ever feel judged by you. And I really did feel like you really cared about me, no matter what I said, no matter what I did. And that was really wonderful. I was like, huh, huh, oh. Sometimes you won't know it at the time. Mostly working with adolescents. So, OK. Do you have these kinds of stories? Yeah. They do amazingly dangerous, crazy stuff. Get them connected to peers. Get them connected to passions. Group therapy is an important consideration in the second half of today's class. And this is like a haiku, because it's just like, will be about groups, and a particular way to do groups with adolescents. They get tired of talking about your feelings. You know what I feel? I feel bored, and I feel that this sucks. OK, now you're happy that I'm talking about my feelings? I Oh, speaking of that, oh, another brilliant, oh, I'll never forget this one. New girl in the group. New girl in the group. She mocked, she mocked every single, every single word, word, I, I said, said. Unbelievable, unbelievable. I finally stood up, went over and said, congratulations. I actually teach how to deal with difficult adolescents. You beat me. Checkmate. Well, I don't know about check, at least for this game. You're unbelievable. You're fabulous. I'm so sorry, because I so want your input in this group, but for today, until I figure out and we figure out how to be able to do this, you're going to have to leave the group. But I look forward. We're going to figure this out. And she did one of those, like, and left. I thought about it. I came back the next week. I said, I've been thinking about you. What do you think it said to her, actually? Or what should I have said to her? Afterwards, a week later. Remember the concept of shifting. Good news about knowing about shifting is you feel it. You know what their inner world is. It's like, nee, perfect mirror neurons. Oh, I know what this is. So I came back and said, you know, I thought about you. I even thought about you between waves. That's right. That's exactly what's like, wow, really? I'm that important? <laughs> you are. And I realized. First of all, you have enormous views. Actually, you are never sitting here again because we're this is the last class. We're just thinking, like, God, you really folks on me today, Volcani. I'm sorry, but you're just like in just the right spot. But it looks like it's getting easier because you're blushing less. <laughs> <coughs> I really thought about you. You have enormous power. And I thought, you, you, I talked about shifting. You haven't been in the group where you create another drone in your state. And I thought, I realized I felt powerless. I felt like, oh my God, I, you know, I'm supposed to be the head honcho, everybody running this show, blah, blah, blah. I felt totally powerless. I felt embarrassed. It's hard to embarrass me. Even a little bit of shame. I felt some anger, like, <sighs> I felt some fear, like, holy shit. I mean, it was terrible. I had all kinds of feelings. I realized that's probably how you feel. I must be so alone in there to feel, I guess, I could be wrong, utterly un misunderstood, not understood. And you found this incredible way to have power. But at the same time, it keeps you totally, it's amazing. I need your help. I need your help. You're an incredible resource. Can you please help facilitate the group? Looks like you might be on board for this. You're on board? We're good? We're five? Yeah. And she did. She was fabulous. Fabulous. Which brings me to Psycho Aikido.
Remember, you've got to be a tradeologist, right? We talked about all that. Look for the positive traits. Aikido, psycho Aikido. I just made up a term. I think it might even, there's some article somewhere that's something about that with psychology and Aikido. Aikido is a martial arts in which there is no enemy. There's only an uneducated other. You're not the enemy. You just aren't, we're just not educating. So I'm going to educate you. Somehow you end up on the floor, though. It's an interesting form of education. But they don't hit you or anything like that. They use your energy to educate you. Some might say against you, but whatever. It's like, it comes this way. Adolescents are brilliant if I do it in emotion at doing this. They will confront you. They'll amygdalate you, and you will confront back. Drive me crazy. Right? I ran in an inpatient substance abuse program. In fact, you'll see the tape. And I'd hear it in the hallway. Hey, fuck, I don't want to go grill. No, I'm not going to do that. What'd you say? This the, the teenagers obviously, I'm not going to do that. The guy says, what, what, what'd, you, what'd you say? I'm not going to do that. Well, then you're going to go in your room for now. What, what's any self-serving adolescent who's in an inpatient hospital for substance use going to say to that? You, you, you don't have to be polite. F you. Fuck you. No, they don't do F you. They go, <laughs> fuck you. <laughs> fuck you. And with a stance like that, kind of more weight in one leg than the other. Where do they get that stance? It must be one of those universal body things like. <laughs> so what does the staff do? Because now the staff's amygdalate, right? So no empathy, narrow thinking, fight flight, all that other stuff. What's the staff going to do? That's two hours room time right now. Oh, man, thousand, one, thousand. He's right, six seconds. In six seconds, this is going to go so, I guess it's south. Why do they pick on the south? <laughs> so south or north, whatever direction. It's going to go bad. Truly. And usually within 10 seconds, there's a hold down. Now we got eight staff jumping on the kid. This sounds familiar. If anybody's been in pain, it's amazing. And I was, you know, running the point. How do I give them? I'm not going to sabotage the staff in that moment. It's just so hard for me. I'm like, it's like nails on chalkboard. I can't believe you just said that. So then we do trainings. <laughs> Hence Psycho Aikido. Instead of this, it's this. We could have danced all night. We could have danced all night. Instead, God, that hasn't fired in how many years? That song. And still, what's the next line? Do we know? I don't know. Something for more or something. I could have spread my wings. Never mind. Okay, beautiful. I'm glad you know it. Her passions with musicals, maybe. You've got to do that. So how do you do that? How do you do Psycho Aikido when they're pushing up against you? And try and stay centered. First, you try and stay centered. You agree with the possibility, possibility of whatever it is they say. Whatever it is they say they're going to do that you don't want them to do. That's outlandish, pardon me, ridiculous. You agree with the possibility of their being able to to do it, whatever the it is. They don't expect that. It's the last thing they expect. They expect you to say, no, you can't. For example, Southwood, inpatient, substance abuse. This guy's 17 and a half. Large African-American guy who was in juvie for various all kinds of bad things. And they gave him a choice because they had substance abuse issues. You can stay in Juba, you can go to the Southwood place. First week, it's in my group. It's the second time it's in my group. Actually, it's the second week. Second time in my group. I don't know what happens. He goes, fuck this, gets up and leaves. Okay. I continue the group, and then staff comes in and goes, fuck on, he's packing. He's going to leave. Okay. I walk in, and there he is, packing found somehow a paper bag. I don't know where he got the paper bag, and he's packing. So, following this model, what do you do? What's the first thing you say to him? Or something. It isn't like the first or the right, but what's something you're going to say to him? Besides, I see you're packing. Or, it looks like you're packing. Looks like you're 
getting ready to leave. So then what, if you follow this, what's your next thing you say? You certainly could do that. Let me be really clear. Ah, you're going to get in. Because remember, what is he actually feeling? What is he actually feeling? Among other things. Scared. Scared would be good. If you say some negative feeling, you're probably going to be right. Keep going. Disconnected. disconnected. Absolutely does he feel disconnected. Absolutely feels scared. Angry. Sorry? Angry. I was just going to say angry. Helpless. Uh, absolutely. Helpless, hopeless, pushed around, all that other stuff. So amygdalation. Fight or flight. So he's doing the flight version. He's trying to re-empower himself. So I'm going to have to say something empowering. By the way, the G word. You're going to work with adolescents. You have got to be genuine. I'm sorry. You've got to be genuine. And they will sniff out your... Not insincerity. There's another word that has to do with not being genuine. Now, disingenuousness. I'm not sure you can put a nest at the end, but it's good enough. Oh, God, they sniff it out. And of course, when you get amygdala, you're going to like get kind of authoritative or authoritarian. You know, what should be doing that? You can get defensive and whatnot. And they're just like, cut it out. Stop it. You're just being phony. The best thing you can say is, you're right. I'm desperate right now. They love honesty. Tell them I'm desperate. I'm not sure what to say. You know, you're brilliant. I'm not sure what to say to you right now. See, I moved from you to her now. It's good. I'm not sure what to say to you right now. I'll think of something. But, oh, what should I say to you right now? And sometimes they'll tell you the most amazing thing. And you go, yeah, exactly. Or the other version of that is, okay, okay, you already know exactly what I'm going to say. You're smart, you're capable, you're intuitive, you're resonative. What am I going to say right now? You're going to say, da 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 Whoa, three, absolutely. A fourth one didn't think of? Yeah, that too. Fantastic. Do you notice the attitude, the vibe? This is kind of play-ish in a different level. It's not a mutilation. I'm open. Because I can admit, I don't know what to say right now. You're right. You're brilliant. So I walk in the sky and I say, I see you're packing. No wonder. But we'll get to that in number two. So let me be clear. If I, whoa, yo, ooh, look at this key right here. I'm just pretending. This key right here is the key to the door of this unit, because I'm the head honcho and I get the key. It opens all the doors. <gasps> Power! But guess what? You don't need that key. You've been on the streets, my understanding is, and I don't know a lot about you, since about age 12, 11, 11. I'm a white honky boy from La Jolla, California. I mean, it's ridiculous. The experiences you've had compared to mine, ridiculous. I won't even insult you to say, I know where you're coming from. I have no fucking idea where you're coming from, really. I have no idea. No idea. So. If I didn't have these, and it's some race between you and I, who's going to find their way out of here? What's it going to take you? 91.3 seconds? It would take me, it could take me days to figure out how to get out of here, besides breaking a window. I don't know. You would like, you've already scanned the whole environment. You already know the little leaks and places, crevices to get out of here. Of course. So let's be clear, you want out of here, you'll find your way. I could say, oh, we're going to get 58 guys on a 58 to 1 coverage of you. And you would still get out of here. You'll find a little, with somebody's a little, you're fast. You've been on the streets since you were 11 years old, man. Okay, you win. It's like, hmm. Genuine, positive compliment about his ability to survive, his ability to scan the environment. He understands. He got it. It's true. If one word of that wasn't true, he'd go, fuck you, man. You're bullshitting me. Don't do that. And then I'd have to copy it. You're right. I'm desperate. By the way, when Greer and I, and we'll talk about Greer, when we get to the group thing, we used to the group something, we'd go, hang on. And we'd talk out loud about the group. But we're thinking, I could do this. And they're like, like the parents are talking and they're eight again. It's like, or five. It's a great technique.
This one you're very, 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 very familiar with. Only I'm going to put the word amplified to it. Amplified and genuine. Empathy. Look, let's be clear. Let's be clear. You've been on the streets since you're 11 years old. Free, free, free at last in some kind of dark way. In here, you're told, first of all, when to get up, obviously. When, um, when you do everything. Even your free time is scheduled. Exactly when we want you to have your free time. That's the only time you get your free time. When you get up, when you have, when you have lunch, breakfast, when you have lunch. By the way, pretty much what you have for breakfast, I mean, there's a choice, but mm, what you have for lunch, what you have for dinner, blah, 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 all that. Yeah, one say in all that. And by the way, have you noticed? Everything is therapy. You have group therapy with me. You have your own individual therapist. There's art therapy. There's movement therapy. There is dance therapy. There's rec therapy. There's, there's fucking breathing therapy. Everything is therapy. You must be going out of your mind. Kid is free in the streets at 11 years of age. It's got to be. It's like breathing underwater, breathing in cement for you. I'm a. How long have you been here? been here 11 days. Oh my God, I'm amazed you've been here 11 days. Amazed. So you tell him, you totally get it. In fact, it's worse than he thinks. You really have compassion and empathy for him. Okay? Contrasting consequences. You've already said, look, I know you can get out of here. Okay, you can get out of here within 91 seconds. I totally get why you want to get out of here. You've been here 11 days? Okay. I think the going rate nowadays per day here is $2,500. Oh my God. It's much more now. I mean, you could get a, the, 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 the palace suite there at the Ritz up there for $2,500. Well, maybe not now anymore, but certainly back then. Okay. I will bet you twenty-two thousand dollars. Twenty-two thousand. If it was ethical, dollars. If it was really ethical. I'd even write this down. That, if you escape, which you could do, within one hour to certainly one day of being out in the world, you will do something that is self-destructive, guaranteed. You will steal or something like that. Get in a fight or something like that. You will um, certainly use or abuse drugs, alcohol, something like that. Unprotected sex, you'll do any one of those or all of the above. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. Yeah. Now, he went right to, which amazed me, but I don't give a shit. What they've never done, which really amazes me, and I told you about the guy, you know, future you, and he's dead on the street, you know, with the teeth. Remember that now image? They never argue whether or not that's, in fact, self destructive. They'll go with that premise. But what he says, I don't care. I said, that's exactly it, dude. And I don't know you well, but here it is. Last week, the first group, and you were with us, I saw how you looked at Kathy when she was talking about her dad molesting her. There was no doubt that in your tough, hardened face, you had compassion. You were pissed at her dad. You can believe a father would do that. And then you had this compassion. I could be wrong, maybe it was just a light, but it seemed like you even had like this little tearing going on. That's hard. That man deserves being cared for. And what I'm hoping, maybe in this time here, we can help just a tiny bit. You learn that you deserve to take care of yourself. That's all, that's all I'm saying. I'll be back. Because what I'm not gonna say to him then is, so what are you gonna do, huh? huh? Are you gonna stay or not gonna stay? Because then it almost forced him to go, well, that's all nice, but I'm leaving. I just leave him. He didn't leave. He stayed the whole time. Okay, psycho Aikido. Give you one more. Same thing, Southwood. Here's this kid. I happen to have seen him out in the world. He's an individual therapist. He's acting out, doing all kinds of things, and now he's the inpatient. I'm seeing him in David Bergman's office. Bergie is the medical director. Dear friend of mine, wonderful human being. Nice office. You know, kind of redwood furniture stuff. Nice family picture there, nice land, all that stuff. Kid comes in, we're, we're having a session. I say, oh, we got about 10 minutes. He goes, I'm going to come back to the unit. Oh, okay. 
uh, because I hate it. The place sucks. Okay. So what do you... I'm not, I don't care what you do. I'm not going back to the unit. So what do I say to him? Uh, yeah, so you could not go back to the unit. Right. You're feisty. You're strong. I love your feisty spirit. Nobody's going to push you around. So what's going to... So what, what, what should I do? Go ahead. Get anybody in here you want to um, come and get me. But I'm not moving. I have a vision. I've got the vision. Who's on staff today? And he starts listing all the people. Fortunately, one of them looked like a linebacker. I said, oh, thank God, because you are strong and feisty and wiry. And I certainly went through all the empathy. No wonder you don't want to be here. So, you know, like usual. Because it's so easy to tell them why they don't want to be here. It sucks for them in many ways. So... Um, how many people are going to need to hold you? Because we probably will get to that. It's a drag. How many people? Eight. Okay. I'm going to have him plan his own carry up. <laughs> Who's going to hold your flailing arms? They're going to try and hit and choke us. Who's going to hold us? And he starts assigning people different. His legs, his arms. Okay, cool. What do I get to hold? He, I don't forget. He goes, you're going to hold my head so I can spit in your face and try and bite you. Cool, I'll be, thanks for the warning. I'll be sure to hold you from the back and hold you tight so you can't do that either. But even with all of that, dude, because again, you take the wind out of the sails, right? What is he going to say? You get in, I'm still going to... So you already say that. Even with all of us, eight of us, including Bruno Boy, the linebacker guy, and I'm holding you like this, I bet you're going to clog something out of this office, man. You're going to go around the corner, and bam! You're going to get the little, what do you think, the, the, the lamp over there or something? Huh? Right? For the nice family portrait thing, <laughs> Bergie's gonna love that. And then you're gonna come up, we're gonna go down the hall. Life is in details. We're gonna go down the hall. What part of the brain am I now playing out and verbalizing? We're down the hall, and the secretary's gonna, well, I know we're not supposed to look, but oh my gosh, look at little Howie. He's screaming and yelling. He's got eight people holding him, and he's trying to spit in Volcani's face. Wow. What part of the brain am I being? Prefrontal cortex, life is in the details, exactly what's going to happen, moment by moment by moment. And then we'll get you to the, the hallway, boom, and then all, like, all your buddies are going to come out going, oh my God, oh my God. And probably you're not still going to be calm, right? No, no, of course, because you're spunking. So then we're going to go into the, the um, um, isolation room. Left cheek or right cheek? <laughs> huh? No, 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 you know, they still do the howl doll with Thorzy. And you're not going to take it by mouth. Oh, I'm not going to put it in your mouth because you're going to Little hell doll with a little finger. I still play guitar, dude. No, I'm not doing that. So it's going to be in the butt cheek. But I'll give you a choice. Do you want the left cheek or the right cheek? It's up to you. By the way, what are they having for dinner tonight? Huh? Hmm? You know this kid. What's up with Chinese. Chinese? They're having Chinese? This is the other consequence. Contrary, contrasting. So I already said the bad news if he does it. Now I'm going to suggest something else if he doesn't. Oh, I gotta tell you, the food, in all, in all due respects, pretty much sucks here. The Chinese dinner just happens to be, in my estimation, really good. In fact, I actually stay late. It's actually true. Again, you have to be genuine. It happened to be actually really good. Now I'd say it's a little too salty, but in those days, I actually stay late a little bit to eat the Chinese there. Beats my cooking. What's the like activity for the night? Movies. So it's Wednesday, it's movie night. So you get Chinese and movies. So wait, let's do this a second. Boom, boom, bang, bang. You get Bergie's lamp off or whatever. Ah, drama, drama. Everybody's looking at you. Oh, wow, wow, wow. Uh, you're still uh, in isolation. Boop, right cheek or left cheek. And then you're kind of sleepy piece. You probably wait. In fact, you might sleep through the night. I don't know. Or you leave. Again. And um, Chinese dinner, movie night. You decide. I'm going to go talk to your parents. So we got up and left. His parents were outside and we're talking. Never forget this moment. He comes walking out. Love this moment. And he goes to the door and starts knocking. He says, hey, Volcani, come on, hurry up. I want to get in. And I had that little hink. Sorry, it's my own little hink hink part of me. What did he say? I wanted to go in. I want to go in. He's knocking on the, on the door now to go in, into the inpatient unit, because the, the office was outside. He's actually knocking to go in. And I got to say, just hold on a second. Uh, I'm glad you want to get in there, but I got to talk to your parents. <laughs> I'm not making way. Don't you catch the paradox? Probably not. 
irony. I guess it's not paradox. It's actually irony. It's what it is. One more. I told you about the one who almost killed me at St. George Holmes with a big boulder that I still have as a memento to remind me. Be humble. Another scene from our page. She's running once more from the day center. I'm chasing her once more. We come in and to the room and she picks up a chair. She's in that altered state. And she says, I'm going to put the chair through the window. And I say, I don't think that window's big enough. I don't. For the amount of anger you have. Footnote, the window is plexiglass. What's the worst that's going to happen? Pop. And good old Mike Thor's going to come in the afternoon and pop it back in. This is the same one that was about to set the house on fire. Remember, I didn't say, that's not a big enough curtain to light. I can live with this consequence. It's not big enough. No, no, I think you ought to do the one on the left. It's a bigger window. And I want you to feel that anger just boom through it. Then I want you, and I didn't even know about all this PFC, all that stuff, but I kind of intuitively knew that I needed to get her thinking differently. I want you to walk down the nine stairs of the front. I want you to pick up the chair, come back up the nine stairs. One, two, three. I really did this, and I didn't know what I was doing, actually. And come back in, and then I don't know, it's up to you. She's feeling powerless, let's empower. Should you then get the center window or then get the one to the right? I'm not exactly sure. What is she going to do now? He's, she's going to look at me, fuck you! Put the chair down, went into the room. You think she's going to obey me now? Okay, these are all variants of Psycho Aikido. And there's all kinds of, these are big dramatic ones, but there's all kinds of little subtle ones. And they will get you into that space. Okay? Let's try this out. Let's, uh, let's get to somebody. Um, no, you can't tell anyone. I'm going to, um, I'm running away, I'm running away tonight to LA. So you see, my friend, I, I talked to you about um, him, Bob. He's got this cousin, and this cousin's uncle, he's got a friend that owns a taco shop, and he's going to get me a job. So don't tell me I'm not planning, you know, I don't have, I'm planning this out, okay? I'm going to get a job in the taco shop thing. And, um, and we can crash at that guy's son's best buddy's apartment. You, you're tracking, right? I mean, come on. I know you're old, but you can track this. So um, you can't tell anybody. So this is our last session. And you've been really helpful and um, appreciate, and that's cool. What do you say? Where do you even begin? I'm just making this up. What do you think? So you could go to LA. I like that you thought about it, this plan, and Beautiful. really put everything into it. You don't have to do all this alone, by the way. You're doing really well. So right, first thing you see, he's expecting you to say, no, you can't, and all that other stuff. There is a danger to other, or danger to self clause here. You, you, it gets a little tricky. But it's weird because I actually had that ah, kind of happen. Beautiful. I'm gonna run away now. Perfect. To this guy's talking shop because this guy's hiring. <laughs> so, first thing you did is you agreed with the possibility that you could do that. You complimented him on this forethought, planning this all out and whatnot. Okay, beautiful. So now, and you're going you're gonna to do some empathy. I can see why life's tough. You're sick of school. You're having hassles with your parents. I mean, you know, you can do the empathy thing. Really important. Amplify. You're going to be more articulate in speaking his heart than he is. You're not only a witness to his truth, but you're going to be a spokesperson to his truth. Like the press secretary in that moment. And then what do you do? Contrasting consequences, realities. So, and life is in the details. So, what's some comment you might make? Yeah. Something about, sounds like you have a place to stay with someone you know. It sounds like you're excited about the possibility to have something new. Okay, that's the positive. We want to start looking at the possibilities of something negative. How old? I'm concerned of how 
know this person? Well, my Bob's a, come on, you've, I've talked about Bob. Have you not been listening? By the way, you're doing a wonderful job because I do want to go there. The only thing, if, if in fact, the teenager goes, huh? I go, whoa, whoa, hey, so sorry. Don't mean to click you off. Totally. You're amygdalating. I'm amygdalating. I'm sorry. Apologies. But I am curious about it. So wait a minute. So Bob, it's, who is it again? It's Bob's cousin's dad's, no, no uncle? Uncle. Bob's cousin's uncle. Friend? I don't know, I've lost track, I'm sorry, older, you know, I've lost track. I keep thinking omega threes, but I lost track. So he gets to that and they go, okay, so have you, have you met the guy? No, okay. Do you like tacos? I know I had to talk about Mexican food, but okay. I want him to know the details of what it's like to work at a taco shop. So we're gonna go, so you're doing a great job. I'd be start going into those details. What's your shift going to be? What's, what's your shift? Oops, sorry. Am I spilling your coffee now on your computer? <laughs> that would have been bad, but it didn't. I'd owe you that one. Your amygdala just fired. <laughs> but I concurred with you. It would have been bad. I want the details. What's your shift? How many hours? How much money do you need? Blah, blah, blah. Details. How much money do you need to live on? I like grease. I'm not dissing. Hey, actually, I'm more a burrito guy than a taco guy, but wow. But grease, you know, so it smells. I want all the sensations, sights, smells, sounds. What is that reality going to be? Do you have a bed? Do you not have a bed? This is the prefrontal cortex. This is modeling, mirroring. So they're going to be doing the same thinking you're doing. You're doing the neural network of rational reasoning. On the other hand, if you stick around, here's the other possibilities. You're 15, let's say 16, license, cars, more freedoms. And I never say, so what are you going to do, ever? I'll say, I know your inner wise one will make the right decision. Okay, life is in the details of realities. And these kids are unbelievable in challenging you about that. Okay, getting this? Goodness. Okay. Thoughts, feelings, fantasies, reactions as you're hearing all this? I know I'm just pouring out a bunch of stuff for you. It makes sense of some sort. You'd have to practice this because it's hard. Again, you're going to get amygdalated. It's harder to do in the moment. Yes? Hey, if, if it's kind of, I don't know, if you start running through that formula and it works most of the time, then you run up against a situation where somebody's figured out your formula. Oh, I would so compliment them on that. Again, you got to be real. I go, but totally. Oh, that's so brilliant of you. That is going to serve you so well in life. You bet it's a formula. What is my ultimate goal? Well, I hope he says at some point or another is my well-being. That I take loving responses, pay for care myself. Right. You've got these different parts of you. Never forget the parts model. You have different parts of you. Part of you would love to go to LA and whatnot. Another part of you is like, uh, uh, another part of you is like, all these different parts. I'm on the side of the president there, the wise one, the one that can say, okay, I can take care of this. No, I'm not on the side of your drug abusing part. It'll always be with you. I understand it's trying to protect you. Hey, drug abusing part in there, I understand you're trying to protect him. I think you're doing it in a way that's hurting him. I could be wrong, but it's kind of obvious. That's why I call it the perverse protector. Mr. President, hello. I think we need the party. And that party, you can figure my pattern out. Fabulous. That, I'm all over that part. Join the committee. I'm not in your head. I'm a consultant. You didn't hire me. Your parents did. It's a pleasure and privilege. Oh, I remember doing this one. Though. God, I'll never forget this one. It's the I have a dream. Oh, I didn't have the dream. African-American kid, out of juvenile hall. In, it's not inpatient. Outpatient. He looks at me. I look at him. It's like, where do we even begin? I don't know your life. You don't know my... I'm just like, so I say that. He talks, he, what he, he, his, he was stealing. That's what it was. And so he's out of juvie, but he's already kind of pre I say, look, I know I don't know you, and I, but here's what I do believe. I'm imagining you at three or four. And here's the dream you didn't have. 
I don't believe you dreamed, I know there's somebody else, I don't believe you dreamed that at age one, your dad would leave and you would never see him again. And that he was a heroin addict, and as far as you know, he's dead, in all probabilities. I don't believe you had the dream that your mom would also be a heroin addict and kind of would hang on, but then be gone, and then hang on, be gone, and that you'd have eight, was it? Because I, I did read your saying eight, and it was nine, nine different foster placements. I don't believe you had the dream that your brother would be shot and killed when he was 14 years old. I don't think you had any of those dreams. I want a better dream for the 14-year-old that you are now that I don't know. I want a dream that I believe you do have, and that is that you somehow would live a life that's worth living. I could be wrong. Help me help you. Help me help you. How? I don't know. Help me help you. Help me help that, that one that at age three would have had that other dream. Someone like that. There's some common ground, because guess what? We do kind of all have the same kind of dream. It isn't that dark dream. And you take the reality and you say, but I, I, I got to help that part in you, because there is that part. So remember the parts, OK? OK, so let me share a technique. Who's feeling brave? Who, who can bring up their inner brave one? This is, good. This is a challenge, I will say. You're gonna, I will say this. First of all, let me, of course, say, your value as a human being is not in any way determined, nor your value as a clinician, by anything you do up here or in here at all. I do believe you will leave here feeling a little more self-respect because you did something that was difficult and you're like, okay, brave one, come. Do you want to know what is I'm going to have you do? So at least you know what you're getting into or not. Do you want to just be surprised? I'm happy to do it either way. You're my boss. Whoever it is is going to come up. Yes, no? Let me tell you what I'm going to have you do. I'm going to have you talk to yourself in a certain specific kind of way. So I'm going to have you sit in a chair and, because I want to show you this technique. It's great for adolescents, adults, or any of us. I probably, I usually don't like to be holding the mirror. I like to be away from the mirror, but in this case I might, oh no. Can you see yourself? Oh yeah, hello. In the olden days, I used to pass the mirror around. I got notes. Don't ever do that again. I felt safe in this class until you did that. You just disearned all the trust that I had. I apologize. I won't do that. What do we have to say to ourselves? Ah, ah, she, ah. I sense I can't. Should I start trying to reel her in? <laughs> Why don't you come on up and find out? <laughs> she says in a coy way. <laughs> no, I'm, no, you don't have to bark. No, come on up. Come on up, take the chance. You're good, you're good. Come on up, brave one. Watch the chords, obviously. Now I'm going to give you instructions firsthand, and then I'm going to have you sit down. Okay, so here's it. I'm going to have you talk to yourself in the second person. Okay. So you're going to be saying, let me model. Instead of saying, I am explaining, you're saying, you, Yunan, are explaining this to the best of your ability. Uh, and hoping that you're making sense. Okay. So it's all in the you. Okay. Why do I do that? Why am I doing that? Why would I have her talk to herself in the you rather than the I? Lovely quizzical looks. Wow, really good. She's ready for it. She's like cracking her knuckles. Because I want the separation, different parts, right? I want that part of you that's loving, compassionate, caring, realistic, truthful, open, honest, valuing of her. Okay. That's who I want to talk to her. Okay? I want you to talk from that part. And the only way to get that part is by separating it and saying you in there in the mirror. I'm observing you. Compassionate observer. This is what we've been practicing pretty much since day one, right? You're looking at the kid. You're mirroring motor affect. What the ideation. Now you're going to do that with yourself. Oh, what a concept. Be your own inner play therapist, value and validating, reflexively reflecting person. So that's what I'm going to have you do. Okay. I'm going to have you sit. I'm going to have you talk to her. Kind, caring, loving. You've known her all her life. 
you're going to know her all her life. You're the closest person to her. Okay? okay? Have a seat. There's no wrong way of doing this. Can you see you? Because I can't see whether you can see yourself. Can you see yourself? Can I scoot forward? Okay, I'm going to hold the mirror up. I, but okay. All right. Okay. I should warn you. Let me say something. My hair? <laughs> That's exactly my point. Yeah, your hair is out of place. It's ridiculous. No, my point is, any one of you, ready, you watch this? Watch. Look at yourself for a second. I promise you, the first thing that came out, what part of you, what part of you first came out when you looked at yourself in the mirror? The inner critic. Remember the gavel I have to represent the inner critic? I don't know, per, well, I can't say a person on a planet, but most everybody, almost 100%, the first thing they look at is whatever is they least like. Oh, my hair is out of place. I noticed my eyes were a little red. I don't know why your eyes are red, by the way, but they are. Um, though I wasn't really critical, it was more like, what's that? Immediately your critic's going to come out. Immediately. Put the critic aside. Okay. The good news is the compassionate one can be compassionate about the critic. I've never heard or seen the critic be critical of the compassionate one. I've never heard someone going, oh, you're so compassionate about yourself. I have had people say, ah, oh, you are so critical of yourself. That is so painful for you. I'm doing my best to help you push that side. You can't get rid of it, push it aside. Never, I, that I've seen, that I've helped people do. I've never had anybody criticize the compassionate part. But I'm sorry I didn't warn you. Their critic is immediately going to come out. That's why people told me to stop doing that. It was so painful to them. Okay, so critic, step to the side. And, and by the way, the critic is the perverse protector. It is trying to protect you. Okay trying to make your hair look perfect and all that other stuff, but it's in a way that ultimately hurts you. That's all. I'm not going to get rid of it. Use it as a consultant. Only text once a day. It might stay if you turn You're thinking this way? That's a good lateral thinking. Can you see yourself? No. no. Okay. But well, I like the lateral thinking. All right. So just tell her right now as you see her. Can you see her now? Yes. Perfect. How is she feeling, thinking, and what's going on for her right now, present tense, in the moment, mindfully? Mm. You're feeling, you're, go ahead. Um, I want to congratulate you on making it to your last graduate course ever in your graduate career. Absolutely. <laughs> Bravo. Yeah, okay. You made a deal with yourself your first year that you wouldn't go to your class, the last one, ever. <laughs> bad, bad, you did. Wow. Uh, just, just Love your openness and truthfulness. <laughs> um, but, but you made it. You're here, um, and you should be, you should be glad that you're in this situation at this point in your life. How is she feeling right now in this moment? Right Tell now, her. in this moment. Right now, in this moment, you're feeling. My heart is beating out. Your heart is. Your be heart is beating out of your chest at this moment. Um, I don't think they know that though, but that's okay. Um, and um, you are not regretting volunteering for this role because this is kind of interesting. Um, <laughs> how's the hair? How, how's the hair? The lighting in here is great. No? Lighting is great. Looking good. Like the okay. Tell her. Three. One, two, three things that you really respect about her. A footnote. If she doesn't believe it, let me just go off camera, so to speak, or off mirror for a second. If she doesn't believe it, say, look, I understand you don't believe this, okay? I know you're going to come to realize that, okay? Because you're the compassionate girl. You're the wise one. You get the bigger picture. She might not believe what you're about to say to her. That's okay. Just own that. Don't tell her that because you know her perfectly. You know her 100% perfect empathy. You don't even need mirror neurons. You are her. You know her perfectly. What an opportunity. Um, I know you think moving to Colorado in two months is going to be difficult um, because you're going to be away from your family for like the first time in your life. And um, But I think you're going to be just fine. And I think the year is going to pass by quickly and then you can move back to California and be happy and with your family. Um, I think... Things you respect about her in terms of that. I think you're brave. I can't see myself. Oh, oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I think you're brave. I think brave. you're brave. Um, I think 
you know what you want and you go after it and that makes that's made all the difference um, yes. for every element of your life and um, there are some pieces that are still missing in your life and I think that's okay that you're not complete at this point and I think you will get there when the time is right. Fantastic! <laughs> Thank you! <laughs> Bravo! Bravo! We're going to take a break in a moment after we finish. Thought, but first of all, how was that for you and her? How, how was that? They talked to us. Oh, it was cool. I liked it. Okay. Liked it. That's Good. Essentially, whenever I'm like kind of uh, in a song that I don't really like all shit in the mirror or just like. Beautiful. So it, it felt more natural than I, than I thought it would. <laughs> That's fantastic. Thoughts, feelings, fancies, reactions as you watch that. It's funny, I should have looking at you. Correct. And not always at the mirror. Very hard to actually make. Just, I, I invite you. I was going to say challenge you, but I'll say invite you. Tonight, at some point. Just go to the mirror and just look at yourself. Straight, not to the whatever little, straight in the eye, soul to soul. See how powerful that is. It's amazing how much we don't really make contact with ourselves. We look all over the place. But not a criticism at all, by the way, it's fine. And you did more eye contact than, but that is one of the things that you'll see people do. Is they'll look to the side. Look at yourself straight on. Oh, man. Powerful. Well, I thought you did that in the beginning, at the end, when she was talking about that it was OK, she wasn't totally complete yet. Yeah. She looked much less at you. That's she true. Was actually, really focusing on herself, which made yeah. her feel like she had slipped into that moment by monic almost with herself. Correct, which is ultimately unimonic. Mm -hmm. Being by monic with yourself is ultimately unimonic. Thank you for remembering that thing because I was just thinking the exact thought that really what it is is being unimonic. If you can be compassionate, genuine, realistic. Money. So, yes, please. And when you were saying, like, if they don't believe it at first, to yes. just go ahead and, like, report oh, yeah. that, and then it's enough to have said that. Because it's still empathy. I understand you don't believe this. I understand you don't believe this. But I know. I know a greater truth. And I know you don't trust that you know I'm saying this, that it really is. It is. And here's how it's going to be. I used to just say, in fact, on the video, if we get that far on that video, there's a Girl, who I say, just fake it till you make it kind of philosophy. Now I say, tell them that you understand they don't believe one word of this. I know you'll come to realize this truth. Because the reality, I mean, half full, half empty. Might as well go with a half full. I know you're getting this truth. Your role is, you're kind of, you're, I, I usually stand on the side, and I'm just listening for the critic, and I'm just giving, wait, tell her, blah, blah, blah. Excellent, 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 great. Oh, wait, critic, 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 come here, critic. I know you're trying to help. Not being helpful right now. You're just, we can use your information, but not that way. Keep going. That's how you're doing this. So there was a heroin addict on the Southwood Inpatient Unit, which was unusual. He was a Hispanic guy, and he used to um, mug people as they come across the border. He was basically, in some ways, the hardest client we ever had. Patient, I guess you call him. Why? He was so compliant. I mean, you think it'd be hard. No, he was so compliant. It was creepy. Anyway, talk about reading, you know, being reading, man. What? Huh? We're having this treatment team. We're talking about him. So, so how are we going to get to him? Because he's so, you know, it's like, so we come, I come out and he's right there as it happens. He wasn't listening in. He just happened to walk by. I'm like, wait. Not to be stereotypic, we'll call him Carlos, but whatever. <laughs> Carl. Carl, Carl, we were just talking about you. Oh yeah, yeah. Let me tell you straight out. We don't think we're we're reaching you. I don't think we're. You could be caught. You're, it's unbelievable how good you are at like doing everything. But we get the sense like we. What is the perfect response for that? It's unbelievable. What would be the perfect? I mean, they could be various. He gave the perfect response. You know, I've been worried too. Ah, <laughs> oh, come on, Carl. Carl, you're doing it again. I think you're doing it again. Ah, uh, yeah, I think I am. Okay, here we go. Come here. Come here. Two others, come on, we're coming into the bathroom. No, we're not going to work you over. No, you're okay, dude. Don't worry. You look amazed. I didn't know the word to make the lady back then, but he looked worried. No, it's okay. Here's what we're going to have you do. I'm going to have you talk to Carl in the mirror. 
Second person meaning, uh, Carl, you, blah, blah, blah. But here I'm going to tell you a specific thing I want you to talk to him about. I want you to look in the mirror, straight out, eye to eye, and talk to him about his loneliness. <coughs> Swear to God, he does. So, I, so you can be very structuring. Ultimately, I think this kid's really lonely. Disconnected, here I want to put it. He does this. Oh, shit. I went, whoa, what just, what, what just happened? I don't know, I don't know, and I, uh, I don't know, just really, I, I gotta get out of here. I went, Carl, dude, wait, come here, man, that was awesome. That was the best piece of work you've done the entire time you've stayed here. That was real. High five, man, that was awesome. He's like, whoa. And he, cause that was real. He, that, he, he it's really hard to confront yourself in a disingenuous way. Really hard. When dear Tom Rusk, my mentor, so, used to work with these very high-end sociopathic-ish type guys, that's where I learned the mirror. You put him in front of the mirror and says, you talk to him. So I die because your truth will come. There's no way you can lie to yourself, really, and look yourself in the eye. I mean, maybe there's some real mutant sociopaths that could really do that. I've never met one. They'll, <coughs> It's an amazingly powerful technique. Amazingly powerful. And you've got to compliment them, even if they go, oh, I can't do that. Far out. Bravo, pushy me. Tried to get you to do something that was beyond. Yay for your inner good protector. The party that goes, wait a minute. This isn't good for you right now. Bravo for you. Don't worry about it. If it ever comes to pass, because I don't want you to criticize you. So there's no wrong way, even if they back up. Do not have your clients do this until you have done it yourself and you feel comfortable doing this. I tell you, it's an enormously valuable tool in then internalizing the compassionate, loving, caring, self-respecting part of you that you then can come to. You don't even need the mirror anymore. It's in here. It's incredibly. And you start with just, I see you're brushing your teeth. You're feeling kind of funny as you're looking at this. You're feeling a little nervous. It's getting a little better. This is kind of hmm. perfect mirroring. Ten minutes, come back. We don't have much time and I want to get through the next section you're going to enjoy. Ten minutes, come back. Come back at, actually come back a quarter after, quarter after ten. We're going to do this. No, that's perfect, because I did the ministry. Thank you. But it felt terrible. <laughs> We'd have to do it all, the, all over, alone. I'd have to do it and pretend you're here. I was saying that I imagined we were at class. Yeah. I imagined you yesterday. If we had to cancel class, that you were in your office. We all had to still watch it. You still do it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so adolescents. Serotonin is lower in general than adults. So it again relates to judgment. Serotonin helps in prefrontal cortex judgment and whatnot. So that's another aspect. Um, there, you remember that primal amygdala, it feels right, doesn't feel right, which then in latency kind of develops into fairness or not fairness. Oh my God, they go bonkers with that sense of principle. They're very attached to their principles. And particularly, the autonomy, give me liberty or give me death. I mean, they will self-sabotage in the name of being independent. Don't tell me what to do, even if, even if I do like chocolate ice cream. You're telling me I have to eat chocolate ice cream? I'm not going to do it. It's amazing. All right. Oh, and educate them. I mean, the good news about their brightness is I do educate them about amygdalation and all that stuff. I tell them about the monkeys and bananas and the monkeys and grapes and the fairness thing. Give them those tools for self-reflection and understanding about what's going on in their neurobio processes. I do send their, oh, I'm going to get you a bunch of these, art, whatever's left over and there's a nice cover story from National Geographic on the adolescent brain. I'm going to get you all that. My week has been extremely busy between two graduations, etc. Not to get defensive here, just giving you the facts, ma'am and sir. Uh, so I will get you all that. And, and so I'll send them, and I'll send their parents that National Geographic article on the adolescent brain. It's great. So you have some knowledge. Helps pre-FC. Groups. Since they're so attached to peers, 
as their primary in many ways attachments as it ought to be, group therapy is a marvelous way to be with them. There's a lots of different types of groups. The model I'm going to show you, I'm not saying it's the only and the best or anything else. Yalom and all those kinds are really interesting. DBT and skill acquisition is wonderful. There's lots of wonderful ways. But I, having been in gestalt kinds of stuff and psychodramas and other things, felt this seems to fit better. And it goes like this. If you're not familiar with group, and I sent you into a room with, God forbid, 10 teenagers. Mm -hmm. By the way, it could be the worst day of your life. They are piranhas. Talk about shifting. Oh my God. So it's Tuesday morning, and you're at a stoplight, and you suddenly feel this <gasps> in your stomach, and you realize, oh, fuck, tomorrow's group. <laughs> And it's not even until 4 in the afternoon, so it's more than 24 hours ahead. And you're already dreading those piranhas that are going to get you. And they are. And in the olden days, and we learned very quickly, because don't forget, internships need you. We need you. We have these kids, say, go, get them. Oh no, they'll get you. They'll eat you alive. So Greer, who was my co-therapist, brilliant, marvelous, expressive arts body, Movement therapist, fabulous. She gives the workshops when we go, go see Greer. Fabulous. She's the one who brings Tom Toms into the group therapy room. Group therapy room was almost this big. No, ta no table chairs. We're all on the ground. We're on the floor. Get on the floor, man. Feel the earth. We do all kinds of things. But in any event, I realized it's piranhas. So we would actually model for you and do it with you and then wean you into doing it on your own just like I do with parents and foil therapy. So if I just sent you in the room next door, you'd probably do what I call hub of the wheel group therapy. It's kind of, thank you, pen. Can we get a little brighter pen? It's kind of just a footnote on what I just did. It was a vain, a failed attempt at trying to be the causative agent. I didn't like that pen not working. So what did I say? Thank you, pen as if I had control of it. It's really interesting. I know that seems weird, but it actually is. I'll notice that I happen to do that. It's one of my styles. When I don't like something that happened, I'll say, great, fine, I like that, thank you. I just do a reflection. I realize it's trying to be the one up, the, the ultimately causative agent. I made you be that way. <laughs> thank you. Uh, sometimes. At least being aware of it will certainly solve me well, but thank you. And I'll serve you well to be aware of being able to say that. It serves well. Okay, Hall of Mirrors, we're here. So the hub of the wheel is. So how was your how was your week? Blah 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 blah. This is I'm pretending it's impatient. So the, the teenager will talk to the therapist. And then you go to the next teenager, talk to the therapist. And they all talk to the therapist. They don't talk to each other. And in fact, it used to get so bad that I would take the intern, ah, two interns, we wouldn't put an intern alone, two interns out of the circle of the group, put the chair outside, or if you're sitting on the floor, have them sit in a circle with each other and you be on the outside and explain to them why. Because they're like, what are you doing? Because if I'm in that circle, you'll talk to me, you won't talk to each other. And by the way, I'll get you to do that, kind of my own anxiety, own amygdalation. So I'm sitting outside because it's your group. Oh, okay. And then what they'll do is, they'll, they'll look at you and say, well, sh she took my album and she, they still won't say you. They'll talk in the third person to the person in front of them. Even though you're by, you as therapists are behind them, it's amazing how hard it is to do this. I haven't run groups since the texting generation, so I don't know if it's made it even harder. Maybe they'll just text to each other in group. Hub of the wheel. Let me propose something different. Let me propose the pool playing model. Group members are balls on the table. You are not a ball on that table. You're not part of that group that way. It's their group. You're a director, you're a facilitator, you're a pool player out here. <coughs> Say Emma has the power in the group. And by the way, you'll see it on the tape. Um, forgot her name, but it'll come back. 
ha clearly you'll see she has, you can identify, she has the power in the group. See, it's a team, that's great. Ho Katie, Katie was co cooperative, she'd been there. In those days we could keep them for three to six months, oh my God. Champa's payments and whatnot. So Katie had been there a while, she was, she was the wise one, she was amazing, fabulous. And she had tremendous credibility because she was on the street since age 12. But if Katie had not been, say Emma's not cooperative, but she's the power one, they're roommates. She has the hots for him. He has the hots for her. She's cooperative. Here comes my opening shot because I want Emma to talk. I don't say, so Emma, how was your weekend? She's going to go, I'm not going to do that. Or, how was your weekend? None of your fucking business. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to ask you. Tell the group, not me, tell the group, how was your weekend? She'll talk. Let's say they're, they're a couple, let's say even. I'll say, ask somebody. I know she's going to ask him about his weekend. Boom. Happens. She has to ask him. You ask her. Boom. You ask her. Boom. Eight ball, corner pocket, right there. Mm -hmm. You getting this? Yes. I don't want to ask her. Forget it. I want her over here. But she's Rebecca, boom, boom, what am I start right here? Bong, bap, 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 boom, ta da. That's the mentality. That's the mindset. It's your group. But I'm trying to get you in the right direction. And if the power person is going to start sharing, all the rest of you are going to share. And that's good for you. One rule behave respectfully. It's the only rule. Yeah, you can say fuck, just don't say fuck you. Another way to look at this, you're a movie director or, or a play director. You're not an actor on the stage. You're looking at that stage and you're thinking, wait, 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 come down over here, a little louder than that, softer than that, blah, blah, blah. You are directing this play. You, are, you need to be in charge, by the way. And you can certainly be reflective and all empathic and all that, but you need to be in charge. You need to have a plan where it's going. You want them to connect. You want them to connect to each other. You want them to connect inwardly to themselves. You want to evoke the wise one. Okay, so I've got plans here. So well, the other is in the olden days, and maybe still there used to be this thing called string art. It's a bunch of nails on a board and colored strings, and you kind of wrap them around, and they become this beautiful, that isn't so much beautiful, but nonetheless this beautiful mandalish pattern. All right, looks weird, but whatever. They are the posts. Their connections are the strings. You're a weaver. You're helping them weave this. Okay? They love it. They love it. I don't ask them about talk about your feelings. It's not that I never do, but that's not where I start. I have them do exercises and experiences. Oh, there's so many different ones. Metaphor group. I'm a seal. What are you? It could be anything. It could be a concept like love. It could be anything. You're a unicorn. Seal, unicorn. What are you? Dolphin. Dolphin. Not a bunch of animals. So once upon a time there was a seal, and off you go. And then the dolphin. Boom, 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 boom. And they tell amazing stories. I'll never forget the one where one was a key and the other was a, a door with a lock in it. And the dialogue those two had was pure poetry as this key wanted to open the door. The group's an automobile. Write down, you're not going to actually do that. Write down who is which part of the automobile. Who's the engine? Who's the brakes? Who's the music? Who's the blah, 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 blah. And then you read off and they write down what everybody said about them. What astounds me is I've never had anybody insult anybody in those things. Not respectful. They don't. Imagery group, you lie down. We're on a boat, big ship. Now. We're on our own little boat that comes off the big boat. Now we dive into the ocean. Maybe you have, you know, face a diving suit and all that, scuba gear, or maybe you can just breathe underwater. Blah, blah, blah. You're going down to the very bottom. You find this beautiful treasure. Now bring it back up. Open your eyes. Share with the group what the treasure was. Some will say, I don't trust people. Oh, fair enough. I want you to stand up and I want you to go around the room. Tell each person one thing in a way that you do trust them. Would you trust them with your CD? Would you trust them? And they will do that. Globe to the specific person. Okay? Then we would do pieces. And there's all kinds of different pieces. Somebody ran away. Empty chair, of course. 
talk to him or her. What do you want to say? The person's missing. Still a member of this group. The energy's still there. Let's talk about it. One guy ran away, came back, was incredibly negative. Group gave him feedback. We did the future you. He was like, fuck all of you. Smoking dope and I'm proud of it. I said, okay, let's have a funeral. Let's just honor the fact that the part of Bob that didn't want to use, cared about himself, loving, respectful, responsible, is dead. So let's have a funeral. Greer gets out the tom-tom, we lower the lights, I have a kid lie down on the ground like this. I said, Bob, why don't you, since you're not part of the group, why don't you go to the end back there? And he did, and there happened to be this folded ping pong table up. And I had this whole image up, this is perfect. We're gonna do this funeral, let's give eulogies. And then we were gonna carry, literally pick this body up and put it behind the ping pong table as if that's the burial. It was right where Bob was sitting. And then we would just quietly leave. Oh boy, this would be powerful. So people are giving eulogies, God, I'm so sad, blah, blah. And I'm about to say, okay, let's lift him up, and because we've done it. And somebody says, well, maybe Bob wants to talk to him. Mm -hmm. Frankly, never occurred to me. I mean, come on, I've got, I, come on, I'm the director. I got this play, man. This is drama. You don't understand. It's going to be really good. And he gets up and says, yeah. I'm like, oh, oh, okay, great. Falls to his knees. God, you're gone. I don't know what I'm going to do without you. Shit. And he starts crying. It's like, and I go, hallelujah, he's resurrected. I mean, obviously, if you're grieving him, that's the part that you never mind. It's good. <laughs> it's unbelievable, the power of group. We would have them bring their old bong, or, or their, um, actually, we use the bongs for inoculations. I'm going to show you the tape. We'll talk about inoculations. But I also have them their stash bag, and some of it's an elaborate carved wood thing and whatnot. And this is their last group. Everybody gives some gift. I gave you the gift of courage. I gave you the gift of around that room. And then gives the box back to him. There is no way that guy is going to put drugs back into that thing. That thing almost floats with mana by the time it comes back to him or her. Okay, you getting a sense of this? Who else is feeling brave? Some other brave one. This isn't actually going to be that hard. Not near as hard as talking to yourself in the mirror. Come on up. I want you to think of a part of you that's not your favorite part, some trait, quality, attribute. Okay. I mean, I have the inner slacker, God knows. Okay, mm -hmm. you have that part. I do. Perfect. Describe for us that part. That part is, likes to be in control all the time and okay. likes things her way, thinks okay. she knows best. Okay, perfect. Let me just do one quick aside. Usually what I would do is a short other one, then this long one, we don't have time. The short other one is I just have you come up, choose somebody in the audience to be you at age six, and talk to us and introduce her. That's a really simple one. This is one doing group. This is more complicated. So, okay, so choose somebody in the group to represent that part. Uh, like literally pick somebody? Yeah, yeah, pick oh, somebody in the group. Emma? Okay. Emma, Emma, come on up. Okay, come here. Talk to us about this part. Tell us more about this part. This is the part of you that's in controlling, whatever. Likes to be in control and thinks her way is the best way. Um, can get upset about little details that don't, don't go her way. Um, can be really hard on the other parts of herself. They don't perform. Like, well. like what other part? Like a part that might be cooking dinner and messes up a part of dinner. Oh, the imperfect one. Yes, the imperfect Who's going to be imperfect one? Uh, <laughs> right here. This just come. You just, well, no, you're the closest. Come here, imperfect one. Here comes imperfect one. Now, I'm going to have you. It's also an easy part. So no, no, I know. It's a big stretch. It's I mean, stretch. I don't have to do anything. I just <laughs> you're imperfect. You're the perfectionista. Yes. Right? Okay. Come a little closer. Come on, people. Do you live all together in her head. Um, okay, why don't we just start with that? That's a good. Okay. Remember Jung's or any of those opposites? There's always going to be opposites. You're looking for opposites. Feel the energy, how it lightened up. That's not amygdalation. That's play. That's a great space. <sighs> Tell her why you're so important for her. Tell her right now. Why um, she needs you. Why she's grateful that she has you. Because um, 
I'm a very confident part of you, and I uh, keep you responsible and um, holding to your commitments that you find so important. I am a very important part that drives you and to all of your achievements and um, kind of drives your successes. Um, Yes, I was going to Yeah, that's why you're here. I was going to apologize, wasn't... even though sometimes no. I'm hard on no, you. No, no, oh, 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 no, that's a totally different part. Okay. No, you're, that's good, but that's Sorry. a totally different part. <laughs> right, I'm the reason you're here. Yeah. If it wasn't for me, you wouldn't even be here. You wouldn't be standing here, literally, correct? Correct. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Tell her why you're important to her, why she needs you. I think I'm important. Why I'm important to you is because um, the IQ is grounded and allow you to know that everything doesn't have to be perfect all the time. And allowing you to see yourself as imperfect allows you to grow and strengthen the certain parts of you that you want to strengthen, but also not have to take complete control of yourself. What do you have to say to him? Um. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, start with a ha. Huh. Yeah. Jeez. What are you doing here? <laughs> perfect. Perfect. You're such a jerk part. You're just a jerk part of how to make Yeah, it but feel. you're messing up everything. So we're tr really driven and trying to get things done, and then you're over here thinking it's okay if we don't. Well, I think you're going to be driving her crazy. Well, with you, we're not no going to accomplish anything. Well, no one can be perfect, and you know, you're striving for something. She's no doing a very good do. job achieving everything that she set out to do. I mean, look where she is right now. I know, with the little imperfections on the way, keeping her motivated to continue. <sighs> Me. <laughs> no, you don't. What are you talking about? You crazy. You know where she would end up? On the streets. She'd be homeless. Homeless. Do you hear me? You want that? Huh? You want imperfection? Homelessness. Yeah. She won't be brushing your teeth. At least. At least homelessness. At least. What do you have to say to that? <laughs> Better dead and imperfect than perfectly quaffed and dead. Or something like that. Yep. What's, what do we need here? What's the compromise? What do we need? A little of each. Little of each. Little of each. Little of each. No, I've been picking on you too much today. Who's a little of each? Come on, come on, come on. Little of each. Somebody come up, come up here. Little of each. Perfect. Wait, you already, what? What happened? All right, I was, yeah. Yeah, okay. okay. No, no, because at the end, I want you. So to introduce to us a little of each. Talk to us. This is a little of each. <laughs> is um, the one that mediates sometimes the arguments that occur between the imperfectionistic piece and the perfectionistic piece and tries to um, encourage to try new things um, and to say it's okay to not do them perfectly but does say you have to do stuff and you have to do it well you can't just gaff it off beautiful so you're going to go over here and say i so respect you i'm so glad you're here and i'm going to consult with you to make sure that she stays on task. I'm, I'm counting on you, okay? Trust, I am going to listen to you. You're gonna feel heard, okay? And, uh, but, but, don't want you talking to her directly. I okay. want you to talk to me first. You're assigning her to do that, correct? Because you are the prez, you are the boss. Right. Gonna go to him and go, thank God you're here. Playful, fun, light, realistic. Hey, you know, well, I'm perfect, that's cool. Boogers exist. Bravo for boogers. <laughs> so, no, no, you're not. Have, maybe I don't, no, I'm not saying you have one. Um, so I'm going to consult with you to make sure she's playing enough, relaxing, being able to accept imperfections. And then you can report to her. So go ahead. Okay. Thank you for being here. Beautiful. <laughs> you played such an important role to make sure that we uh, get things done and have a drive to succeed and keep going even though things are difficult and not just quit. Thank you so much for being here. Um, you keep things light enough to recharge from working so hard. You make things fun and it's hard because it's you. <laughs> I know you. Um, you, you are the part of you that can be empathic to mm. other people to see their, it's okay for them to be imperfect. And without that, you couldn't do your job well. You need both. Please do not speak to her <laughs> directly. And instead, talk to me, and I will speak your truth. <laughs> Agreed upon? Yes. Agreed. High fives. 
or something. Yes, <laughs> team. Beautiful. Go. Not only adolescents, but adults love this stuff. And it creates a bond, by the way, between the people that's very unique. You might remember each other as, oh yeah, you remember that, oh yeah, yeah. Like when I do the, the ch child one, that creates a real bond. Okay, you're getting this? It's fun. I remember I was, once I was, Southwood had two different sections, and one of the sections was having the problem with this kid who was lying. So of course, I came over and I said, introduce to the group the, the liar part of you. And what's the positive functions of that? What does it do for you? And how it you know, gives you power and all that other stuff. What's the other side of it? Loneliness, isolation, you know, all that. And I'm never going to be really valid for who I am because nobody sees me, blah, blah. Teach us how to lie. How do you do that? You're so good at it. I always give the one about the blue dresses, an ethical lie. You remember this one? And the Anne Frank. I've told you those, right? It's an ethical lie to say to a girlfriend who just bought a brand new blue dress that looks like weird to me. And she's loving it. It looks wonderful and beautiful. It'd be cool to say it looks weird. You look like a Cossack. Nothing wrong with being a Cossack. Um, if she's in Nordson trying things on, I could say, you know, everything looks good on you, but that might be something better. I got, I'm going to say, yeah, you look beautiful. And if you're hiding Anne Frank, for God's sakes, lie every day of your life, and you better be good at it, and curse the neighbor across the street that didn't lie. So lying is relative as to when it's good or not, but it has consequences. So it's fluid, it's fun. Let me talk about inoculation groups. So these kids are hardcore drug addicts. We had them for three months, which is astounding, sometimes more. They still go back to that world. And when they go back to the world, chick at doobie, 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 do. Yeah. That's what is the real world. That's what they're going to be confronted with. So we better inoculate them. We better train them what to do and say when that, in fact, happens. We better give them a new association to this. So you'll see, I had them do this group. They all knew. I got consents from the parents and everybody else to do this group with a bunch of inoculations. We had Monday, Wednesday, third Friday group. Wednesday was inoculations. They would bring their bongs. They would bring their alcohol, whatever. And we would inoculate them practicing saying no. And there was a stop. I went to Caltrans and got a stop sign. It became the unit logo in the background because I wanted something that reminded them out there in the world to stop using drugs. And every time they say stop or a red light or the color red, it meant stop using drugs. I wanted a mnemonic. So you'll see that in there. Um, turn off lights. Hopefully everything's going to work. Be kind. Light, please. Oh, let me get the camera on the screen. I'm remembering this. Uh, uh -huh. Okay, perfect, and we're going to run this. Oh, it's in black and white, sorry. By the way, Tim over here, God, I'm so, what am I, it's so blurry. Uh, Tim over there, his parents were drug dealers. He was their mule at age six. I told you about that. And he would take the drugs, get the money, because nobody's going to bust a six-year-old. Unbelievable what the lives these kids had. Unbelievable. So I'm introducing all of this to them. Oh, one of the things they're going to do is they're going to start being wild. Say, good, be wild. Three minutes, and then got to get to business. Uh, kid, uh, kid barks in group. Woof! I say fantastic. Last three minutes, I want, to, I want you to do at least ten different noises and teach the group how to do noises. For right now, I need your focus. Okay? Oh, never forget this one. How you know you're supposed to sit in a chair like this? Well, this is when we're doing group in chairs like this one. This kid was able to follow and face follow that rule and yet disobey at the same time. Lateral thinking. What did you do? He sat with his feet here, his tush here. He says, Volcani, facing forward, all four down. I said, brilliant. He said, love your lateral thinking. It's all about being playful. No, okay. Well, I have your own here, too. Uh, I think you're going there, right? That's fine. 
That's Kate. Yeah, we will, Tim. One of the kids didn't want to be on camera. I said, great, run the camera. Do you notice how they're already volunteering to do stuff? Hey, can I want to involve any table? I want to, that's what I want. I want a group that can run on its own. Just go inoculate each other. Okay, and they're incredibly supportive of each other when they do that. I'll never forget the one where the, the father molested the daughter and they talked to that dad. It was unbelievable. I'll never forget the one where it's easy to identify with them as victims. They're also perpetrators. They also beat up kids. They do bad things. This one girl, beat up a pretty looking teenage cheerleader just because she was pretty and was a cheerleader. I said, imagine she's here, talk to her. She says to me, that's too easy. I'm going to talk to her dad and tell him what I did to his daughter. Wow, not a dry eye in the house. I had one look in a camera and talk to his dead grandmother and tell her what he wished she knew about him. Not a dry eye in the house. It's unbelievably powerful. understands what it's about. It's learning how to say stop when you're in a party. Again, this is very directive. I want you to, they, not one of them has ever argued with me that there isn't some part of them that does not want to use. It might be 0.0001, but that's what I'm going for, the 0.001 part of you that doesn't want to use. That's the wise one, that's the one that's going to take good care of yourself. That's my co-facilitator here, go with that. By the way, we would use um, powdered sugars, we would use tea, we use all kinds of different things to represent various drugs. See how they go right into their patter? Yeah. 
What are you thinking? What are you seeing? I know, too bad a question. Too bad. Because they're all yelling stuff. Yes, that's the most important thing. The most important thing isn't my voice, it's their voices. Their peers are saying, stop, don't. Katie becomes, and you'll hear in the next one, unbelievable. Think of what it did to you. Uh, unbelievable. What part of the brain is that? Dorsolateral prefrontal cortex going, wait a minute, think of what it did to you in the past. Think of what it might do to you in the future. We're all symbolic motor reality. We're all inner externalizations of inner aspects of self. Let's have really healthy inner aspects of self. And say, stop, don't do that. Think about that. I am a cheerleader there. I'm a coach and shield. See, I'm, not, I'm nowhere near them. I'm standing in the back. And then I come in going, good, good, Tim. And I'm watching his face. Because sometimes I can see he's getting tempted. That's why I say, wait a minute, you might want to leave now. You might need to leave now. You're sticking with it. Okay, good. Good, Tim. Good, Tim. And when Katie goes, you'll see in the next one, she starts saying, stop. I'll say, good, Katie. Good, Katie. Yes, Katie. I don't even focus on the kid. I'm focusing on Katie because that is getting to this kid's head and heart. And I'm hoping when they're getting the do pass to them, they go, stop. Think of what that did to you. No, thanks. I'm cool. That's powerful. They're awesome. They're the co coaches to the healthiest part of that other person. At all. Actually, can you do this? Now, some of the three main things you do to help the class not do this in this situation. What are the first things? Two of the kids, by the way, are brand new to the group. They get acclimated right away. Okay. And the other thing I'm going to do right now is you can also call your friend with the one right there. They need to stop pressuring you. Stop pressuring you. Wait, Monica, did you hear the three things? Okay, Monica, did you hear the three things? I know she didn't focus. So I said, Monica, did you hear the three things? Yeah, tell the group. First, It's very hard for them to imagine telling their peers, hey, stop pressuring me. I wanted to have the two meta comments. Stop pressuring me. I need your support.
We're going to do Monica. By the way, Tim likes Monica. Again, she's new on the unit. He likes her. No, it's a stop sign. It's always in the background so that the kid can see the stop sign. Okay, now I'm going to stop. Make sure Listen to Katie. I mean it. No! I mean it. That was really powerful of Tim to say to her. No! Crystal was her drug of choice. Go to the beach and look at the birds, says Tim. Notice I don't ask a question. Is your life going to be better? I tell her. I want you to tell these drugs how you deserve a better life. How your life is going to be better without these drugs. Tell them now. I'm directive. I'm telling it straight. I don't ask her. I don't want any room for we'll meet. And they do. They do that. Why am I doing this? Because I want a new association. So when the bong is in front of them with a doobie, sorry. <laughs> They have already talked to this doobie and already told it, I deserve a better life. You destroy my life. They have that association along with stop signs and voices that say, stop, think of what it did to you. Hear Katie's voice, hallelujah, because you're going to need all the help you can against that inner user, that perverse protector that's destroying you. Notice I also said how weird it was to do this. I already prefaced it. Right. Okay. Get started. Very good. They'll talk globally. I want specifics.
So I just highlight every negative thing she says. I guess it has messed up your brain. Tell us how it messed you up. Group. That's extremely powerful for her to do that. We're going to do one more. I'm going to show you one more now. Okay, we'll do. We have a team over there. We'll do something else. We'll do some other. So I'm watching her. So the seat room comes around. I could tell by how she looked at it that was really hard for her. So tell the group how that was for you. And she said, that was really hard when the seat group comes along. I go, yeah, I can see that. So what I'm going to do next, I mean, you can do a zillion things, but what I decided to do is I'm going to have her tell the group one horrible thing that happened on Seagram's. Again, I don't ask her, did something horrible ever happen to you on Seagram's? Because I don't want her to say, oh, no. I'm going to tell her, tell this group one horrible thing that happened to you on Seagram's. I know she's going to come up with something. It's a created reality. She comes up with a doozy. By the way, this is when talking about feelings in this kind of context is really important because then you can connect on this level and not just <laughs> good shroom level. And that's real connection. Again, tell the group this time one incident that was real bad on the secret. Tell the group some incident happened to you that was really bad on the secret. I mean, Scott. She's going to say something important. Pay attention. When I got raped. Talk louder so the camera can hear you. Thank you, Mr. Sensitivity Tim. No, I can't. Tell this group. Is there a way why you deserve a better life than being cast out and raped? I deserve a better life because I'm a person. In what way? What are some good things that you can do about yourself? How much food? I feel that I'm strong. I don't let people make us 
So now I'm going to use the group to prove her point. Tell this group ways to deserve a better life than to be passed out and raped on secrets. Tell this group. I'm strong. I don't let a lot of people in. I'm going to try and reframe that in some ways. The protector, not make some vulnerable, but yet you let certain people in. And I help people. Tell her how she's helped you. Use the group to prove her point. Tell her how she's helped you. And I don't ask the question. I tell them. Do you think of how she's helped them? Or how she has let some people in here? Or something? Give me some feedback about what you tell her. I'll get that out in you again. See how they talk? Tell her. That's true. So, anybody else get some feedback, Katie, about something they appreciate about her or something way she's helped? I like your style. Tim was the elephant of the group. I like your style. So some other things I did. Drug tug. Part of you wants to use, part of you doesn't. Make sure you stack the decks. The part that doesn't want to use wins. And literally have a rope thing and they pull. And I want you to feel in your body you're making a stand against drugs. You as a staff member never represent ever the side of a drug. Ever. You're on the side of the light. You're not Darth Vader. He used to be good. He ends up good. But he was dark in the middle there. In case you don't remember the sequence. Okay. So I did drug tug. I have him talk in the mirror. There was a really good piece. We don't have time. Where Holly talks in the mirror and tells her why she deserves a better life. All of that. At the end, have them all close their eyes. I have them tell us time that they were about to use or time they did use. They talk about time they used. Uh, Tim was at the beach, he's in a van, he's smoking. I say, okay, go back. I want you to see the scene, see the scene. I want you to, I want you to stop it right before you're about to use. Okay, so see the scene, so I'll go back in. Oh, I can, okay. Uh, you're about to use, about to use? Yeah, open your eyes. I have the stop sign and I scream, stop! I say, okay, go back in that scene. See yourself not using. Now tell the group, what did you do instead? Tim went out of the van, went for a walk, looked at the birds. Again, anytime you see a stop sign, that means don't use. Do an inoculation. See yourself not using. So, of course, I have, I think I've already shown this to you. Eh, I didn't realize I wouldn't go right to it. That's okay. Hey, stop sign! And I use it with my clients sometimes. I'm about to say, stop! And then I text them this stop sign. Okay? Lots and lots of things. An amazing power of that group. Thoughts, feelings, fantasies, reactions. Do you see this? Make sense to you? You gotta get facile at it, obviously. You gotta have some training at it, obviously. They love it. As you can see, they're like, yeah, yeah, let's do an ocular. I'll an ocular. 
And they love doing those pieces, the different parts, the different things. Yes? It reminds me of when we discussed dreams and how we had that dream to do the dream. On the nose. It's all the same. Outer, inner, all the same. And that's the beauty. You're doing play therapy in your mind. You're doing play therapy in your life when you're fluid like that. Well, now it's time to say goodbye. Mm -hmm. oh, you probably, do you guys know what that song is from? To all our family. Yeah. M-I-C. <laughs> See you real soon. <laughs> K-E-Y. Why? Because I like you. I think we like you, actually, because it's the whole thing. M-O-U-S-E. I hope you learned and or enhanced an attitude about children so that you reflexively reflect, so that you value and validate their inner worlds, all of it. <coughs> so that you're a tradeologist. I hope you gain skills, specific skills and ways of doing the above. I hope you gained a further appreciation of the magic mind, as well as the PFC, obviously, the whole symphony up here. I hope that you further clarified your own psycho philosophies, beliefs, religions, understandings. I hope that you've gained even a further appreciation of the marvel, wondrous species we're all a part of, privileged to be a part of. And I hope that you've gained even a further appreciation of how bitchin, without the G, you all are. Go have a fantastic fabulous summer, taking loving, responsible, respectful care of yourself, being a tradeologist to yourself. Live fully, thrill sensibly, and above all else, live your life as play. Thank you for being part of this. Please do do this. Bye. I know I'm not supposed to be in here while you're doing that.